Welcome back again to BadQuaker.com podcast for Friday, October 7th, 2011. This is Ben Stone. I've been away from the microphone this week. If, you, uh, if you've been over to BadQuaker.com, uh, we left a note over there. We've had a, fa- a family emergency. We had a similar situation in September. We had to... Uh, break away and drive across country and take care of a family health issue and that has uh, uh, continued and we've had to again uh, drive across country and uh, try to attend family needs and help as much as we could with the current emergency that's going on. Um, We do appreciate your patience and uh, Hopefully within a few days or perhaps a week, we'll get back to daily articles at badquaker.com. Until then, uh, we do appreciate you sticking with us, and uh, we'll do everything we can to try to put out as many articles and podcasts as possible during that time frame. Uh, Kai is still back in Ohio trying to hold down uh, everything that's going on there, keep animals fed and so forth and so on. And uh, my wife and I are in... Uh, Missouri at families uh, trying to deal with the family issues that are going on here. Until then, I wanted to cover uh, something that I've been watching. Something that I've uh, a theme that I've kind of tried to maybe push on people, perhaps too much. I hope not. The my my goal is to uh, be able to show how to how that we can see past what's obvious and what's being offered to us and see the more important issue that's behind the scene. I've used the the example of puppets and puppetry and a puppet master. I've used the examples uh, that Thoreau used of striking the branch rather than the root and we need to find the root and strike the root rather than being fascinated by the branches that hang out where we can see them. One way or the other, I've got a, f- a few issues that I wanted to cover today. Um, I was over at uh, LewRockwell.com recently, and he had uh, the transcript of a, of a lecture that he gave. And it has a, a really good piece in it that I wanted to read. Um, when you think of the word fascism, this can mean many things to many different people. Some people picture some... Um, distant past things that happened long ago with bald dictators standing on uh, leaning over handrails speaking to the public and or we can think of uh, little mustachioed German individuals with jerky movements and exaggerated expressions speaking to crowds um, if that's what you think of when you think of fascism you've bought into what the state is selling you. Some people, when they think of fascism, they think of uh, mean Republicans out to do bad things. Uh, Again, you're just buying into what the state is selling. Uh, Some people might think of uh, neo-Nazis, skinheads, racists, all these things. It's All these are what the state offers for you to see rather than to look beyond and see what the what the real truth is. Lou Rockwell, in this article I was mentioning a second ago, gave a wonderful little statement. I'm going to read this for you. And there will be a link on badquaker.com to uh, not only Lou uh, and his article, but several others that I'm going to mention over the course of this podcast. These are Lou Rockwell's words. He says, Fascism is the system of government that cartelizes the private sector, centrally plans the economy to subsidize producers, exalts the police state as the source of order, denies fundamental rights and liberties to individuals, and makes the executive state the unlimited master of society. Um, I would almost agree perfectly with Lou Rockwell on that. I would say that's a very good description of fascism, but The thing to keep in mind is you don't need all those aspects to have fascism. It's kind of like the thing I mentioned the other day on a podcast that I quoted um, Ron Paul, where he made the joke of uh, someone uh, having a touch of pregnancy. Well, 
fascism, socialism, any other uh, aspect of socialism, like fascism is an act is an aspect of socialism, and so fascism or any other aspect of socialism doesn't require all of of its description to be active at one particular moment in order to still be fascism or socialism. So, uh, for instance, with Lou Rockwell's definition. He says, fascism is the system of government that cartelizes the private sector. Now, that's pretty well required. That's, that's step one, and that's, uh, without that, you don't really have fascism. But uh, the cartel- cartelization of the private sector, centrally planning the economy to subsidize producers. That is a little more vague than I'm comfortable with, but essentially this also is required of fascism. You have to have uh, an, at least the motion towards central planning of the economy. And you have to have the government interfering in the market in the sense of uh, making winners and losers by subsidizing some and penalizing others. Uh, so that's an aspect of fascism. But but that's two degrees. It can be that can be to a vast amount, or that can be to a lesser amount. But back to Ron, to Ron Paul's statement, um, you can't be just a little bit pregnant. You can't be, you know, you can't have a little bit of socialism. It's either socialism or it's not. It's either fascist version of socialism or it's not. So once you have central planning of the economy, even if it's only to a degree, it's still fascism. It's like being pregnant a little bit kind of pregnant. Either you are or you're not. And so once fascism is there, it's either there or it's not there. Fascism interrupts the market to whatever extent that it infects the market. But any fascism is an interruption in the market. Okay, so we have a system of government that cartelizes the private private sector, centrally planning the economy to subsidize producers, and I would add to punish uh, certain players in the economy as well. Exalts the police state as the source of order. Now, it, that's not an exclusive to fascism. We can have that in pretty much any socialist process. But you can't really be successful in fascism unless you exalt the police state as the source of social order. So that so that again we are talking about degrees but the moment that the state begins to use the police and and sell the idea that without the police there would be no social order then you've then you have been fascism is there or at least socialism and the preclude to fascism and uh, Lou goes on to say uh, denial of fundamental rights and liberties to individuals That's an aspect of socialism on any level. So certainly fascism being an aspect of socialism, that's going to always appear in fascism. But it can appear in socialism even without fascism. But either way, the fundamental loss of rights and liberties to the individuals are an aspect of socialism that are certainly amplified when you have fascism. And the last point Lou made was, it makes the executive state the unlimited master of society. Now, this is kind of a fuzzy point because a lot of uh, commentators on fascism say you can't have fascism unless you have a dictator. Uh, many, many people falsely have assumed that if there is no dictator, there is no fascism. Even some prominent fascist dictators thought that. But that's just not the case. If you have uh, one master over you who is beating you, or if you have two masters over you who are sharing in the beating of you, it really doesn't affect the fact that you're a slave and you're being beaten. You're not going to argue, oh, you can't beat me, the other guy's beating me right now. See, the the whole argument sounds a little bit silly. So uh, the real point is not whether the executive in charge is a single person or is an office that rotates through different people or if it's a committee of some form that has a number of people that are represented as the executive of the state 
one way or the other, uh, the state has to be a single-headed entity uh, under fascism. And um, that can be a committee, that can be a centralized committee of some kind, or it can be an individual. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a single dictator. Although total control of law definitely is an aspect of the maturity of fascism, not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily present as fascism develops, but it certainly becomes one of the goals of fascism. So then, um, that's, that's Lou's uh, definition of fascism, and I'm very comfortable with that. Again, I would adjust it slightly, but uh, then again, if I, was to, if I were to be able to sit down and come up with my perfect definition of fascism, I would probably miss a point or two, or not cover something that's important to somebody else. So Lou Rockwell would probably have some criticism to my definition of fascism if I was to uh, do the same. And if you were to take notice of mine. Okay, so now, thinking along the same lines, now that we've talked about what is fascism, then we realize that fascism is the, econom is the economic and governmental system that we see in most of the world today. Uh, certainly, all of North America is fascist-controlled. Um, certainly, all of the major nation-states of the world are fascist. Uh, they may not have a central dictator, but they certainly have a central source of power, and they're moving towards dictatorial power, whether or not they have actually achieved that, or whether that dictatorial power is uh, focused in a single head of state, or if it's in a committee, or a parliament, or a congress, or whatever it might be, or a president, or, or whatever the executive head of state is. It's moving in that direction, even if it hasn't achieved it yet. Now, I wanted to... Uh, I know we've kind of beat this dead horse. Uh, the, the Occupy Wall Street people, um, we've beaten them pretty heavily here at BadQuaker.com uh, for, oh my, two months now? Because we were... Kai and I were talking about it before they actually even started, back when... Anonymous first began beating the war drums and first started talking about the Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Kai and I were talking about it back then, and we were talking about the the strengths and the weaknesses and, and how it was good and how it was not going to be good. Uh, but keep in mind, the vast majority of the people who have been interviewed, who have, uh, who have explained themselves of what they want, of, of those people at Wall, Occupy Wall Street I'm talking about, the vast majority of the pro protesters at Occupy Wall Street have all pretty much expressed the same thought, which is the banksters, the corporations, the money people are out of control and we need to rein them in. The problem is almost all of those protesters and almost all of those people who have expressed themselves either over the Internet, on YouTube, or to actual news agencies the solution they offer is more fascism because they they don't recognize in their head that the banks the the corporations the the money exchangers of whatever form are all just puppets they're all just branches on the tree and to strike at them you're not striking the root you're not recognizing the puppet master and the puppet master is above and beyond them above and beyond even the government or beyond the corporations or beyond the banksters or beyond the military or beyond the police the state is that entity that is that is the puppet master that's behind all of those things so again we just we beat up the wall street people now I'm sorry, the Occupy Wall Street people. Now, uh, there's a, a gentleman named Andrew Gavin Marshall who uh, wrote a wonderful article over at uh, Blacklisted News. If, if you're not familiar with Blacklisted News, check out the link at badquaker.com to blacklistednews.com. I, I try to check Blacklisted News every day. I don't always get over there, but I try to. Um, they've got some way out stuff. It's uh, it's sort of a news clearinghouse area, like kind of like uh, lourockwell.com is. So you get different links to different stories and different writers, and it's pretty handy. Some of the stuff is way out. You have to take everything you find on the Internet with a grain of salt. But there's some good stuff at Blacklisted News as well. And so this article by uh, Andrew Gavin Marshall is a pretty good article. 
he he brings up a point that I have failed to talk about, although I've talked about quite a bit privately. I have failed to bring it up on podcasts, not for any specific reason. It just didn't come up. But he covers it very well. And his point is that um, he says, do not turn to the non he's warning he's warning the folks that occupy wall street he's saying hey i appreciate what you're doing you're you know you're right about many things but here t- keep this in mind don't be like the tea party don't let them sucker you into uh dependency upon these same puppets these same branches of the tree and he says uh, do not turn to the nonprofits and the philanthropic foundations for your support and and this is a wonderful point because it's it's something that i have failed to point out uh, on the podcasts is that these big nonprofit uh charity organizations that are out there ready to hand money to groups who are these real grassroots groups who are spontaneous who pop up who are very enthusiastic who want to get stuff done and then in comes a bunch of this nonprofit money or this philanthropic money from these foundations and and you don't really look a gift gift horse in the mouth when this happens you think oh this will help our car our cause tremendously but the problem is they're just another branch on that same tree they're another puppet in the hands of the puppet master and now somebody might be saying oh no no there's this institution or there's this think tank or there's this uh, group over here that's pure and money from them is good and well, there might be one or two or five or ten. I'm very comfortable with the Ludwig von Mises Institute and everything they represent. So so I'm not throwing all um, non-profit organizations and all philanthropic foundations. I'm not throwing them all under the bus here and saying they're all tools of the state. But I'm saying a very large portion of them are. A very large portion of very well recognized and very respected charities in the United States are simply tools of the state. You you think, oh, I'm going to go jog a mile for this cause, or I'm going to give my money to this to support this organization, and they're going to cure this horrible disease that's devastating these this group of people, or I'm going to give my money to to this organization over here, and they're going to support this wonderful cause. But what you don't realize is. The money that you give very often, not always, again, not all uh, organizations are like this, but a, but a good portion of them are. You give your money to this organization, it doesn't go to the cause. It gets split between the people who promote the organization and lobbyists that go to try to get the government to twist the laws to support the organization. And so the money you're giving doesn't actually go to cure that horrible illness or solve that horrible problem or feed those terrible hungry people. The problem is that your money goes to feed another branch of the state. And so when you're on the receiving end of that, it the same thing is happening. If you've got a grassroots organization coming up and 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 growing and you're getting you're gaining in popularity and you're really looking like if we just had that little bit of funding to get us over the edge and then one of these groups comes in and they they offer that to you I'm thinking of the story of Jabez Stone does anybody recognize this, the name Jabez Stone with the little moth flying around saying Jabez Stone where'd you get your money Jabez Stone And this is going back to the devil and Daniel Webster. And in that story, um, Jabez Stone got his money from the devil. And because of that, then the devil devil became his accuser. And in the story, uh, Daniel Webster then had to defend him against the devil. But But the point being that it once you take the money from the devil, the devil being any branch of... Uh, the state in our case of for our discussion we're talking about certain philanthropic or certain nonprofit organizations you start taking their money to do good with it well let's take that back can you do can you do something bad and then get a good result can you take polluted evil money that that comes from an organization that's an aspect of the state and then do enough good with that money to overcome the fact that you've been polluted by the state. Well, 
You know, you may be able to on a temporary basis, on a short-term basis, but the long-run result is not going to be a net gain. It's always going to be a net loss because you've polluted your your good, the goodwill of what you're trying to do, you've polluted it with the evil of the state. I'm thinking right off the top of my head of the, the maybe the most famous or at least the best known example of this is Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Here was an organization with the most noble of causes to try to save lives and and specifically, you know, to, to save the lives of innocents who were killed by drunk drivers on the highways. But what it turned into was simply a tool of oppression by the state and is no longer it, there there are no redeeming qualities in mothers against drunk driving it is now simply a hammer that the state uses to beat people with and and that's an example it may be an extreme example but it's a perfect example of how these things always work so uh Andrew Gavin Marshall's article is a wonderful warning to not only the people that occupy Wall Street, he also mentions uh, the, the Tea Party people as well, um, and how the Tea Party uh, movement has been so polluted by this, uh, this money that's been flowing into it. But there is a problem with Andrew Gavin Marshall's article. He falls into the typical thing that we see libertarians falling into, and that is the confusion as to what is the state and what is the government. Now, in his article, he refers to the state as being the problem. Um, but if you really look at what he's saying, he's talking about the government. And then he talks about this entity, this other entity. And, he, he, and it's an unnamed entity that he refers to. And what he doesn't realize is that entity is the state. What he's calling the state is actually just the government. So if you look in my writings, you'll notice that whenever I refer to the state, in that sense, it's a capital S, like Bill or Tom or Satan. It's a capital S representing the state because it's an actual entity. It's not just a government like the state of Kansas has a government or the state of Missouri has a government or the state of uh, New York has a government or the city of New York has a government. And all these are, are lower case in, in my writing. But when I write about the state, I'm talking about a specific entity. And that's the entity that he fails to name the, uh, when he confuses the state with the government. Remember, the government is simply one of those puppets. The government is not the state. It's just simply one more branch on the tree of evil. Okay, uh, now, this is going to be maybe an odd transfer here, but I'm still talking about fascism. So what I'm about to say, even though it... it oh, let me, let me back up. Um, what Andrew Gavin... Marshall is warning about with taking money from these organizations is the fact that eventually uh, you'll fall right back into the trap. The Occupy Wall Street people will fall right back into the trap of actually supporting a different aspect of the same fascism that they're fighting against. Because unless you realize that the fascism is what the state is utilizing in this particular financial situation that we're facing, then you don't realize that it's the state. You, you blame it on this group or that group, and you end up getting polluted by this money, and it throws you off, and you don't see the point. Um, so now, taking the, uh, the discussion towards a Gary, Ar a Gary North article that I was reading recently, let me just say, I don't agree with everything that Gary North says and writes, and Gary North has been wrong at times. He's he's often uh, it's often thrown in his face on the internet that he was wrong about the uh, Y2K thing. Well, uh, it is kind of dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket when you're seeing a coming collapse. And so Gary was seeing aspects of many different things that seemed to be coming together at the same time right in there. Um, but in the long run. I'm not going to argue with Gary North on a lot of points, and I'm definitely not going to argue with him publicly, 
because his intellectual capability is so far beyond mine and his education is so far beyond mine and his uh, the the amount of knowledge that he just keeps sitting there in reserve in his brain is just unbelievable um, so I'm not going to openly contradict Gary North. Uh, what I am going to point out, though, is in, in the article uh, that I was reading of his, and there will be a link to Gary North's article at badquaker.com as well. Gary North points out um, a group of people that he calls the Greenbackers. Now, the Greenbackers are, are uh, a particular f- uh, group of people seeking to back the dollar um, not using gold, but using uh, other means other than gold. And they have uh, existed in one form or another for about 150 years now. Gary's, Gary's article is way more specific than me. I'm giving a horrible, inaccurate overview here. But um, Gary North has put a lot of energy in uh, debunking the greenbackers. And as he points out, there's one thing that you're going to notice with all greenbackers. A, they're not economists. B, they have no formal training. C, they don't have a lot of published uh, work out there that can be academically uh, challenged or um, scrutinized. Um, A lot of their material is based on hype and emotion and a real good portion of the material is based on half truths and truths. So what they'll do, it's it's an almost cult like process that they use. And I say almost because I'm not saying the Greenbackers are a cult. They're not. They don't have some of the classic requirements for being a cult. But they use cult like techniques in order to lure their people in and keep them within the movement. The Greenbackers have gone on gone under a number of names and they don't always call themselves greenbackers at times but essentially we're talking about people who support fiat money in one form or another and reject hard money the difference between money being backed by something like gold and money being backed by something like credit or belief systems like uh, the federal reserve or whatever although the federal reserve is to a large extent based on credit as well but Anyway, but this is not a money. What Gary North points out, he he mentions several real popular videos that are hot on the internet right now. One of them is called The Secret of Oz. Another one is called The American Dream. And the other is called Money as Debt. Now these are really good videos, really well done. And when I say good, I mean they're entertaining. They, they, they They present their argument in such a way that it's very difficult to refute them unless you really know what you're looking for. But here's something. Uh, The first of these three that I saw was the video, The American Dream. And it's a little cartoon thing, and and it's very, very well done. And I was very impressed with it it when it first appeared. But watching it, as it gets towards the end, it's like, um, it's like, have you ever been eating almonds? And you're eating one almond at a time, and all of a sudden, and and you've got like, you're popping one almond in your mouth, but you've still got two or three that you're chewing in your mouth. So there's a blend of different almonds, and you're you're chewing almonds along, and all of a sudden you get this weird flavor in your mouth. It's like, hey, that's not right. And you're not sure which almond that was, but one of those almonds was bad. And that taste that you that you taste in your mouth is actually a poison that appears naturally in... Um, in peach seeds, because almonds and peaches are they're hybrids of the same uh, plant. So uh, sometimes some of that poison out of the peach seed will wander into the almond in just slightly enough of, a, of an amount that you can taste it. And it gives you that really weird taste in your mouth, makes you want to spit out everything in your mouth and rinse it really quick with water, because you know in your mind something was not right about that. You may not even know which almond it was, but you know something's not right. Uh, Using nuts as an example, uh, walnuts can be the same way. You can be eating walnuts and all of a sudden you hit one that's just not quite right. And, well, the reason why is because some almonds actually contain, I'm sorry, some walnuts actually contain a mild poison. And sometimes that appears a little stronger in one walnut than it does in another. 
this is especially true with black walnuts. So, so you get that in your mouth and you'll want to rinse it out because it doesn't feel good in your mouth. Well, the first time I watched the, the video, The American Dream, that's what happened. I got, I was like, hey, this is a good, this is a good video. This is really good. They're saying a lot of good things. And then it was like, well, that's not quite right, but this is a good video anyway. And then it's like, ooh, that's, that's, there's something not right. And then you get that taste in your mouth. You're like, ah, I got to spit this out. And unless you're really sharp and unless you can pick out what's wrong, you may not necessarily notice that. And that's why the more we hone our, taste our palate to be able to spot fascism then the easier it is to see it and go ah there it is it's that one right there right there that's the fascism and you can spit that part out um and that's the case in these uh videos the secret of oz the american dream and money is dead it's hidden it's subtle it's right in there but they're greenbackers now, for a better debunking of greenbackers than I could ever produce, we're going to put a link to Gary North's article, and he's got, he's just got, Gary North has a ton of stuff on the greenbackers, because years ago, he picked those guys out and just started hammering them, and he's never given up. Um, the next group I want to talk about is a little, a little easier, perhaps, for me to spot than it was, the, than, than to notice the greenbackers. Uh, I first saw the Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist movie. Oh my! When it first the year it first came out, I can't remember when that was. Two thousand eight or so? Two thousand six? I'm not sure. The first year that the Zeitgeist movie came out, I saw it, and I watched the the very first one of them. And I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, man, this is a bunch of old recycled stuff from. Uh, Oh, there was a book back years ago called uh, Babylon Mystery Religion, and there and there's a bunch of like borderline Eric von Daniken stuff in there, and I'm watching this thing, and I'm like, and I'm re realizing that there's just half truth after half truth after half truth, but it's fed to you in a in a in a extremely brainwashing uh, form. It's it's very professional, very well done. Lots of half-truths, lots of unsubstantiated statements, and little lies just stuck in here and there and here and there to guide you towards the, the, the conclusion that they want you to have at the end of the Zeitgeist movie. And then there was this, the follow-up movie to that where they more openly came right out and, and you got to see what they really were. And this is coming from whether we're talking about Zeitgeist or whether we're talking about the Venus Project or any other way that they describe themselves or disguise themselves. Uh, the one thing they're not going to say, they're not going to call themselves socialists. They'll, call, they'll say, oh, it's a, uh, oh, what is that that they call it? Oh, it doesn't come to mind, and I don't have it in my notes. But there's, they say, oh, it's not socialist, it's this. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you go back and break down what is socialism, that's what that is. They're socialist. It's a central planned society. It's a central planned government. It's a central planned market. It's in, in the purity of these Venus Project zeitgeist people. What they want is computers and machines to do all the heavy lifting of society, to make all the heavy decisions. Everything will be digitalized. Everything will be, all the decisions will be made according to what the computer thinks is, the computer thinks is the most efficient process, and then it's going to be enforced. And they don't use words like enforce. They say, oh, well, people will come to this. People, people will turn and they'll voluntarily come to this. Yeah, you know who else used to say that? Well, I can make quite a list. Uh, Lenin said it quite a bit. Uh, not John Lennon, by the way. Um, but also Karl Marx said this, and so did Engels, that people would change. Pretty soon there would be this perfect socialist man, and he would want to take out the garbage. Yeah, right. It's the same socialism. You know, you take a uh, here. There's an old joke. There's an old joke about a guy who uh, has this little dog, and he's walking his little dog, and he's walking along with his little dog, and this other guy has this big mean dog, and he's kind of a jerk, and so his big mean dog just attacks and kills the guy's little dog, and the guy is heartbroken. He's like ah, and the big mean guy is like, hey, what are you gonna do about it? And so. The guy with the little dog takes his little dead dog and 
and buries it and has a ceremony and is heartbroken. And then the next day, he's walking along and he's got his leash and he's got the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. And the guy with the big mean dog comes running up and he's like, he looks at it and and the object on the end of this leash jumps over and just eats the mean guy's dog. Just eats it. Hump, hump, hump. And the dude's like, that is the ugliest dog I've ever seen in my life. What do you call that? He says, well, but before I cut its tail off and painted it yellow, I called it an alligator. Okay, so my point in that is that it doesn't matter if you cut socialism's tail off and paint it yellow, it's still an alligator, all right? It's not a dog, it's an alligator. And that's what the Zeitgeist people, the Venus Project, that's exactly what they're doing. All they've done is take socialism, repainted it, put some new wheels on it, polished up the fenders, and they're handing it to you with all of its rotted interior. That's all it is. It's socialism, pure and simple. On top of that, why would you believe that machines can do all the work for us in this wonderful utopia and computers are going to make all the big decisions and they're going to control all of the trade and all commerce is going to be controlled by these super wise computers? Have you never watched a single science fiction movie in your life? What, what next? Uh, the, the, the aliens are going to land and they're going to be benevolent and they're all going to treat us nicely and, and we're going to... You know, no, 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 no. The greater society always eats the lesser society. It's a cookbook. It's a cookbook. To serve man is a cookbook. That's a obscure. I wonder if anybody will get that. Anyway, so whether we're talking about the Occupy Wall Street people or whether we're talking about the Greenbackers, we're still talking about fascism. Now, to be honest, the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist people are not fascists, they're pure socialists. They're, they're not even going to mess with fascism. They're going to eliminate money. They're going to eliminate all personal property. They're going straight to the pure version of socialism. And the only twist that they've got on it is that s somehow it's going to work because of computers, magic computers. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up at that. Um, the, the key is to look beyond what you're being handed. The key is to see beyond the the flashy videos and the cartoons or the or the the weird enticing music that's on the videos or all of the flash and all of the hype and getting past all that and say what is this person really selling me what is the real product that they're pushing on me and the odds are if it doesn't recognize private property and the zero aggression principle you're in all likelihood talking about socialism in one form or another. It doesn't matter if they cut its tail off and paint it yellow. It's still socialism. For more on liberty, property rights, and zero aggression principle, go to badquaker.com. And thanks a lot. Bye.